before we move on? If not, I will, I will come straight then to Jamie, if I may. Um, and you're going to speak particularly about your UBS Optima Foundation. Well, Tim, I have a number of hats, and so let me just list a couple of them. One is um, I'm head of the wealth management business of UBS in the UK. I'm also chairman of the Optimus Foundation, which is a grant making foundation. Um, and let me, and I, what I'd really like to talk about, though, is what we've done in the space of social investment tax relief, SITR. Um, just by way, if you haven't have, if you haven't heard of UBS, we're the largest wealth manager in the world. And, um, <laughs> We have two trillion dollars of client assets in our care, which, which is an enormous number. And if you imagine that all of our clients, really virtually all of our clients, are active philanthropically, that's quite a large pool of capital available. And so, knowing that our clients are all active, largely active philanthropically, and wondering, can we move that conversation on? to getting them interested also to complementing their philanthropic contribution with impact investing, social impact investing. And if you do the arithmetic, imagine if we got our clients to move 5% of their assets into social impact investing. We're now talking about $100 million of capital put to social purposes. That's quite a powerful vision for us and one we're quite excited about. And in fact, our chief executive is very interested in talking through with clients about making philanthropy and social investing an asset class. In other words, mainstreaming it in their general conversations with their wealth advisors to ensure that philanthropy and social investment are a part of the normal conversation they have. Because the numbers are enormous. Now what's interesting about these numbers is it leaves me and some of my colleagues with the sense that there isn't a shortage of capital for social purposes. That is not the problem. There is lots and lots of money. The problem is creating the match between the people who know how to deploy the money and the people who have the money. And how does that conversation occur? I think that's the really interesting problem. And you see it in lots of different ways. And it's one of the reasons why, on the social impact investing side, the capability building is really, capacity building is really one of the big themes. Because, um, in fact, there's, there's money just how do, you, how do you create that? How do you get them to meet in the middle? And our response to that was to draw on the work that Big Society Capital did on SATR, Social Investment Tax Relief. And let me guess, can I just get a sense from you, a little bit of knowledge about SATR? A little bit? Just a little bit of knowledge of SATR? Okay, so there's a fair amount of the mechanics. Um, <clears throat> the problem we're trying to solve is, if you're an investor, you have capital, and you're trying to move it into socially relevant enterprises, particularly community-based, they tend to be very small. How do you find them? And then how do you build a portfolio? I mean, in particular, if that's not what you do for a living. So if you're not on Dragon's Den and spend have a lot of expertise in finding these gems, then how do you do that? So how do you source um, these projects? And then how do you assess these projects? That's a problem. And similarly, on the you know, social enterprise side, how do you communicate with your capital providers, how do you create that conversation? And our response to that was drawing on the SITR, the Social Investment Tax Relief Framework, which came out in 2014, is to then build a fund in conjunction with an organization in Bristol called Resonance, which we built a fund, an SITR fund, based on Bristol social enterprises. So the objective is to build a portfolio of 12 to 15 social enterprises from Bristol and build a pool, have the due diligence done by somebody like Resonance, which then creates for the investor, it creates a <coughs> diversified pool of these 12 to 15 different loans in this case, to social enterprises, in which the due diligence is done by a capable organization like Resonance. Okay. Now, let's flip over to the social enterprise side. One of the problems with social enterprises is that their cost of capital, generally speaking, these are small organizations, in many cases not very sophisticated organizations, with very, very low capital um, capabilities. How do they borrow money at a rate that allows them to do their mission? Because frankly, 
if you cast them out onto the marketplace, the rates that the market would require to lend the money are quite high. And that's where SITR comes together. So what effectively happens is 30% tax relief creates an additional form of return for the investor, which means that the amount of money that we have to ask the social enterprises to fork up to pay for capital is much, much lower. They can actually they end up being able to borrow at concessionary rates. So even though these are unsecured loans for financially non-stable organizations, they're able to borrow money at a rate that makes sense for them at, say, 4 or 5%. <coughs> the investor gets a return that is that we're, we're targeting net of defaults, we're targeting a rate uh, a return of 8%, <coughs> which may seem high for you. If you have questions about that, we can come back to that. Um, but 8% is an appropriate risk-weighted return for somebody to put capital into a portfolio of um, non-rated borrowers, unsecured non-rated borrowers. That's a, that's a reasonable junk, kind of a junk bond type of return. So what's happening is the social enterprise gets a concessionary rate of borrowing. The investor gets something that looks like a market rate for what they're doing. They're investing in unrated, unsecured organizations in a not terribly diversified portfolio. And that is that is the that's the marriage that's made through SITR. So SITR, the tax, the tax concession by HMRC, um, goes to the enterprise. <clears throat> what it does is it allows the enterprise to borrow at a rate that it wouldn't otherwise, while leaving the investor, roughly speaking, in a reasonably good risk-return situation. So that's the concept, and that's what we're what we're hoping is we've created a way for the two sides to talk to each other about how to move capital back and forth. And we've just we've just launched, and we're looking forward to uh, the fundraising process. But mostly, the dialogue with people about how do we start to expand our clients' deployment of capital for social purposes.